Of the three meetings? Of the outcomes of the Here. Here. have an addition to the agenda. Uh, we have a special presentation which will, um, will come under the review and approval of minutes. Uh, we have uh, Senator, I always like to say Senator, Joe Conroy with us. So um, is there any other items for the agenda? Okay. Review and approval of minutes. No minutes tonight. If you're not ready, they will be um, presented at a later time. Okay. So at this time, I'm very pleased to introduce to you, um, I always call him Senator because that's how I met him, Senator Joe Conroy. And uh, we're very pleased to have him uh, to give special presentation as one of the former um, commissioners for the 1974 commission. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, last week we had a little crisis in the family, a little health crisis, so I, <clears throat> I took care of that instead. Uh, I did want to come because I wanted to thank you for having ran for this job, fought, fought out in the streets for uh, the vote to get you selected. Uh, and uh, I know that's quite an endeavor. So it, it, it tells me that you're good citizens and that we, as a community, should appreciate that. The, uh, the document itself is something that uh, we kind of uh, uh, went through bit by bit. I think our meetings were limited to two hours. And uh, when the two hour clock struck, we were gone. That is, the bell rang. So limit the, the, the time was, was pretty productive in our case. I don't know how it would fit with you folks. There's a lot of things to go over, obviously. Uh, but I want to share a story with you on how I became interested in the change of the charter. We have a son who is just 50. He's a lawyer and he's an engineer and he's an entrepreneur. And he and I were downtown uh, at the bridge and we noticed how, or he noticed how uh, polluted the waters were and uh, of the Flint River. This was a lot of years ago. 
And uh, so I said, and then we went and we had lunch on Court Street. There was a restaurant there right next to where the expressway stopped. So the, the, the I-475 was built from the Grand Blank 75, I guess you'd call it, up to Court Street, and it stopped. And it had stopped for years. So he said, he's 12 years old. He said, Dad, I think I want to go down and see who, who makes that decision. So we came down to the city office here. At that time, it was a city manager, former government. And there was a gentleman, quite a prestigious person, Tom Kay, thought well by particularly the corporations and the banks and, and people who aren't as active anymore in this community. And so I, I told Tom, I said, listen, we've just got a couple of questions for you. And, um, and Kevin will indicate what, what they are. So he told them about the river being polluted and that it would seem to me that the city ought to do something about it that that dam was, was ready to give in and uh, still hasn't, but still is ready. Um, and then the other, the other question was, why did the city of Flint, or why did whoever it was, stop the expressway from going further than Court Street? And uh, because I had told him, and he had seen in Grand Rapids that they had all done their expressways and development was well underway, hotels and businesses and the like. So Tom Kay, the prestigious city manager of the time, <clears throat> said, don't bother me, kid. Uh, I worry every Monday night about the city council and my job. So I thought that was a pretty bad thing, number one, to say to some young student who had a little foresight. But, you know, worse yet for the future of the city of Flint, that, that he was constrained by the city council, in his opinion, um, to make big decisions. So don't let, don't let uh, your decisions uh, get into the way of possibility of progress in this community. And I'm not suggesting to you which kind of form of government to have, but that was one lesson we did learn. And, and we've had some problems with some of the mayors that we've had. There's no doubt about that. But uh, I think we do need leadership in this community. It's been under siege for the last several years. Um, bound by the state of Michigan and, and a lack of, of income. Now, when I was first serving in the House of Representatives, there were 83,000 UAW members in this community, 83,000. Today, if there are 7,000, uh, I'll eat your hat. <laughs> and all of those seven aren't in this city. And as I drive through the various parts of the city of Flint, uh, the north side, the east side, uh, parts of other parts of the city, it's a disaster. So. Somebody has to start managing this in a way that is efficacious and also is productive. And you've got to give the diagram for them to act. You've got to give them that outline. And that's what this charter is. So part of the thing that I did, and I can share that with you just briefly, is every night before a meeting, I had somebody here at this microphone 
that was agreeable to the chairperson of the uh, commission who spoke about something about Flint. And uh, so you want to embrace the community, you want to embrace leadership people if you can, whether it's your minister or whether it's the person that has a, a business or whoever it is, you need to get them involved in this because otherwise it's, it's not going to happen. You're stringing this process in a way that you're going to have to maintain uh, some interest. So somebody on this commission or somebody or some people are going to have to do a lot of that work. And I know that the Flint Journal isn't, isn't able or isn't available uh, as much as it was when, when we were here. Uh, when I was here, we had an article every week on the charter. <clears throat> sometimes we wrote it, sometimes they wrote it. But they used it if we wrote it, and uh, we read it if they, if they wrote it. So it, it kind of helped build some momentum for the ideas that you want to implant in this document. The, uh, that was very effective. I think now you're probably talking about the internet and about electronic stuff that I'm not all that familiar with. You, pro you probably are. Uh, but you need to get that stuff out and it, it needs to be read and responded to by the people that use that internet. You still have some union papers. You have some church <clears throat> churches that you can have somebody write uh, information on that you can stick on the uh, windshield of those <clears throat> church going members. There's a lot of different ways you can still do it. But I don't think that the Flint Journal, and I'm not being critical, I'm just saying uh, the last time I knocked on doors in the city of Flint, I didn't see any Flint journals at the door at, from 3 to 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and so a long time ago, that wasn't the case. You need to find a different way of communicating, and I'm sure that you can do it. There are some people here that have got good brains, and, and we're confident that you'll do well. But it's a, it's a meeting after meeting after meeting effort. And uh, we're hopeful that you're, you're successful. The city does rely on you. And after the state gets out of your hair, or out of the hair of the city, I believe that you are the ones that are going to put this uh, diagram together that will help us all prosper in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Conroy. Questions? Set. Thank you. Thank very you, much. sir. Okay, next on the agenda is public comment. And I'd like to um, let the audience know that our public comment is three minutes. And first we have Ms. We have Ala Bowen. I'm not sure if I'm uh, pronouncing the name right. It's Elijah Wan. Would you say it again, please? Elijah Wan. And the last name? Reader. Reader. Okay. Will you spell that so they can? Uh, A L L A H G A W A N. And Reader is R E E D E R. Go 
one thing I just wanted to say was like uh, something about like the youth, like people my age, they don't really know who y'all is in particular. So I feel like y'all should like try to come to the, I mean not, I don't know, like y'all should come to the schools or something to see the kids. Cause they, like if I go to a hundred kids at my school and ask, do they know y'all? I'm pretty sure a lot of them will say no, the mass majority of them. And I feel like that's our, I, I feel like they think our voice doesn't really mean nothing because they don't even know who they talking to. That's just something I want to say. Thank you very much. What, you what school are you from? I attend Mott Middle College. I can hear you. Mott Middle College. Mott Middle College? Yeah. Okay. How old are you? 17. So your advice to us is to come out to that. Is there a platform there that we can come to? A it's people there that work with you because we have a lot of gatherings and stuff and we have public speakers come down a lot and they'll be willing to, I mean, they'll be open to let y'all come and speak if y'all really wanted to. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So we can contact the principal at my middle yeah. college? Yeah. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Just a comment to go along with that. Uh, we talked about a lot of different places for outreach, but we never mentioned once going into the high schools and actually bringing the student body in to um, participate in the meeting. And uh, this is right on time, sir. Thank you. Thank you very well, much. Course. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Councilman Eric Mays. Good evening. Um, I know I've been trying to keep up with you guys and, and you get distracted in elections of activities, water issues, so forth and so on, but I heard you were meeting tonight and then I had to peek my head in at the end over there at um, the University of Michigan. So I'm gonna continue to watch the process. And I wanted to say that I think it's getting time for the, um, committee to start dealing with articles and making proposals and changes. I know that, you know, in a ideal world, you want to do a lot of uh, outreach to the community, but sometimes I get my work done better in my room by myself. And so I'm gonna urge this um, group uh, to start doing the work and looking at the um, articles and communications. And I'm gonna sound like a repetitive robot when I say over the years that I've looked at the um, charter and understand it. I've looked at the mayor's office, strong mayor, I understand, manager form. I've looked at appointees, political appointees, people who are qualified. The charter addresses some of that stuff. In the personnel section, you'll see people shouldn't get approved by the council just to get approved. You can determine, should all of them be approved by the council? Should all of them have certain qualifications? But then I would go a step further and say this. This is the repetitive part. Manager form, strong mayor form. Should council people have certain qualifications other than 18 years older and get the most votes? Should they be part-time, full-time? It's something to that group there that in my opinion is gonna turn this whole wheel. And I think right now, that's one of my big dilemmas and that's one of your big dilemmas. As you move through the process, I'll give you some, some specifics on that. But I'm eager to continue to watch and see when y'all start making decisions. Some stuff will come from the public outreach, but I really firmly believe that it's gonna come a time when y'all gonna have to just make some tough proposals and decisions and then reach out again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Councilman. And I would like to let you know that that process starts tonight. Is there anyone else who would like to address the commission? Going to move on. We have a lot on our agendas tonight. 
Um, next uh, report, our finance committee. Actually, we, is my mic on? Okay. Actually, we had a special blended meeting kind of with outreach and uh, finance discussing uh, some, some budgetary changes to present to the Mott Foundation sure. at the October 12th uh, meeting. You have in front of you an abbreviated summary of that uh, meeting on uh, last September 28th. It was a Monday. And uh, attached to that, or on the, the separate sheet, is a spreadsheet <clears throat> that shows the budget we had approved versus what we are, we are, we adjusted it to reflect some of the uh, more uh, pressing needs that will go before this Mod Foundation as we seek funding for our future endeavors. Uh, the bottom line is that we reduce the. Uh, actual uh, financial needs of the committee commission to uh, by about $10,000. And the changes are reflected in the uh, uh, two last columns there before you. Um, that meeting, as I said, will take place October the 12th, so it was necessary to meet and discuss these budgetary changes. Um, we also discussed uh, preparing job descriptions for two of the uh, indicated positions we'd like to seek administrative assistant and commission and outreach co coordinator uh, as reflected there. And uh, Ms. McGee was kind enough to work on those job descriptions. Uh, that's pretty much what we did at that blended meeting. Thank you, any questions? Okay. All right, public outreach committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. There is a public outreach committee report We've had a couple meetings, uh, also a kickoff meeting and an advisory committee meeting since the last time we met. So at the kickoff meeting, we had almost 50 people. Uh, we met at University of Michigan Flint September 26th. There was great discussion, and thank you everyone who helped facilitate and um, participate. I see some familiar faces out there, so glad to see you all back. I included a summary of the um, results from exercise one. Each group looked at four different questions. What does good government look like? What does bad government look like? Um, what are some qualities you want to see in city government? And what are some things you'd like to see in the charter? So each uh, group response, then word for word, what they wrote down is here. And there were, uh, you know, a lot of great things mentioned. So I think that Everybody should take some time to kind of read through this, and hopefully this will help us in, in the discussion on articles as we move forward, and we'll look at ways to incorporate this information into our work. I also wanted to mention that we had an advisory committee meeting on, on the uh, October 1st. There was about 18 people there. We met here at the city, uh, Steve Mintline, who was a ran for the Charter Commission. He did a great job facilitating the discussion. I have some draft um, minutes that are not ready for you all tonight, but they will be for your next, the next meeting. Uh, the group went over the same results and gave some really good feedback on these same questions. Also, we talked about the next step for that group, which is gonna be to review Article One and everyone was provided with a copy of Attorney Roth's uh, review of Article One. So between now and next week, um, we're gonna have to think about some discussion questions to share with the advisory committee to help you know, guide the discussion. So I'm thinking you know, things that we're going to discuss tonight later on in our agenda as we look at Article, Article One uh, you know, be thinking about questions that you would like to pose back to, to the group, uh, and they were they were really great. So, uh, our next meeting is going to be uh, for the advisory committee November fifth at Bethel United Methodist, and um, we are, uh, you know, ready for that and looking forward to that as a group. 
there is a survey out on our uh, Facebook page, so a link is out there. So please, if you're on Facebook, share that with your contacts. Uh, we do have an article in their local newspaper, Our Community, Our Voice, coming out. Also, thank you, um, Commissioner McGee and Cherry, for your work on writing that article. And then similar articles also going in the Courier. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Commence McKenzie, for being our conduit to help make that happen. Uh, so that should be coming out soon. Uh, we talked about doing another press release in about a week, including some of the discussion questions from Article 1 and a link to the materials and the survey on our website. Uh, so the survey was distributed at the kickoff meeting. Um, there are also copies available at the Flint Public Library, our community and senior centers, City Hall, and the Social Security offices. And thank you for all the commissioners who came by City Hall, picked up some copies, and dropped them off to different locations. It really helps that we're all working together on, on this effort. So our next meeting of the Public Outreach Committee is going to be October 19th at City Hall, 6 p.m. Thank you. Any comments or questions for the Public Outreach Committee? Okay, the see. Courier will have the survey in this Sunday's newspaper. Oh, Thank, you. Awesome. Thank you. And it was too long. It was too long? It was too <laughs> long. The survey was too long? It was too long, but they did me a favor and put it in there. <laughs> All right. So Thank the you. Next time, please shorten it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, general Communications, uh, written correspondence. I. Um, gave to you a letter from the Planning Commission. If you remember, they uh, did address us, and uh, they, there were some questions that uh, they could not answer at the meeting, so they did answer in the letter. So if you would take that letter with you and uh, apply it um, to the, um, your information uh, for the articles and so forth. Are there any uh, receipts of petitions from anyone else? Um, Madam Clerk, have you received any petitions from anyone? Thank you. Alrighty. Okay, next we have introduction on the first reading of proposals. Under our rules, when we introduce, we just need to read through the title on the proposals. So, proposal number one uh, on the city name. Uh, proposal number two, boundaries. Proposal number three, form of government. Proposal number four, powers of the city. Proposal number five, liberal construction. Proposal number six, definitions. Proposal number seven, qualifications of appointed officers. Proposal number eight, compensation of officers and employees. Proposal number nine, retirement benefits. Proposal number 10, oath of office. Proposal number 11, uh, ordinance required in the public interest. Proposal number 12, forfeiture of office and removal uh, for cause. Proposal number 13, conflict of interest. Proposal number 14, inter intergovernmental relations. Proposal number 15, rulemaking procedure. Proposal number 16, compilation of rules, policies, and procedures. Proposal number 17, hearing procedure. And then proposal number 18, preamble and de declaration of rights. Uh, one sec. Um, yeah, we don't have an 18. We don't have uh, it. That is the one that Jim passed out and have oh, a proposal I'm sorry. number on it. Uh, the, the first 17 proposals are reproductions of the first 17 sections in Article 1 of the current charter. They're just reproductions. Proposal number 18, uh, Jim, do you want to speak about that? Yes, thank you, Commissioner Cherry. Um, 
proposal 18 is um, I'm proposing some amendments to the uh, preamble and the Declaration of Rights. As you recall, in the uh, in the charter, the first uh, um, very beginning of the charter has what's called a preamble and Declaration of Rights. And um, what I'm proposing is a uh, an amendment to the preamble to meet um, to uh, that. Uh, comes from the National Civic League's Model City Charter. Um, and there's some um, uh, reasons to suggest that, um, that the amendment will help us, uh, enable us to uh, function as a, uh, under uh, state law, um, and clarifies that in, in many ways. Um, the declar and we can get into that when we get to me the whole we have a background paper about that. And then the uh, Declaration of Rights, there are some amendments uh, that I have proposed uh, to add into some of those Declarations of Rights. Thank you. Okay. And so I believe it would be in order now for the chair to refer these to the proposals one through 18 to the Committee of the Whole. So moved. Commission. I'm trying to figure out, uh, Mr. Cherry, you wrote something, you, you passed these all out, but they are exactly how it's written in the uh, uh, charter as is right now, correct? Correct. And the purpose of that is so that we can start talking about it in Committee of the Whole. Okay. I guess I, I was kind of wondering why would you rewrite it if it's just already there and we can read it out of the book. So that's, that's why I was wondering. Yeah, it, it's so that when we get to Committee of the Whole, there are proposals there that will allow us to discuss it. Okay. And it also will allow us to um, work on the papers instead of writing, uh, because it, you know, the, the lines are kind of close together. <laughs> this way to give you an opportunity. Each one True. has its own page. Okay. okay. All right, thank you. Uh, motions and resolutions. Um, Madam I, Chair, yes, I'd like to uh, propose before we get too far into our uh, budget, budget, and we uh, are spending monies. I'd like to propose a process by which we adopt uh, a method to expend and pay for the services and and uh, things that are come before us. Uh, Heidi has presented to me, I think you just gave me, yeah. the uh, document that summed up her uh, kickoff expenses, a very detailed document. And I'd like to propose that in the future, as you have done, we put together the documentation, we bring it before our finance committee, and these documents, uh, whatever expense reports and, and receipts you have, that it be presented either by the chair or myself to the clerk's office for distribution of funds. Right. So. And if you would make a, uh, if I you would put that in the form of a resolution? My mm, resolution is to have uh, items that are for expenditures from our budget go before the finance committee and presented to the clerk's office by the chair or finance committee chair. Thank you. Second. Question. Question. Mm -hmm. The uh, commission as a whole will not see those expenses, just the finance committee? Well, she presented a very detailed document, and certainly we can bring the document before the committee, before the whole commission, for you to review. I think that should be done before anything goes to the clerk's office, so it's a matter sure. of record that we voted that those expenses be paid. Okay.
So I'll just the resolution to reflect. Um, she has yet to develop that, or? She has yet to develop the policy, and uh, I think the leader and I are going to work on the, the text of her resolution this week, next week. Okay. We don't have it yet, no. Could we table it until we'll we table get the resolution? It. Yes. We'll table it. All right. So we'll table that, and we'll move on. Um, unfinished business, uh, the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy proposal. Uh, so we were able to get a total of eight students to work on uh, the proposal uh, submitted, and uh, we'll have a meeting. I have a meeting scheduled to talk with them uh, tomorrow, so we're going to start work on parceling out the assignments associated with that proposal to the uh, eight students with uh, Professor Gerber. How many students do you have at this point? Eight. Eight. And they'll be working on this eight to nine hours per week. Are we going to ever meet the Yeah, actually, folks? thank you for bringing that up because uh, one of the things that we had talked about was having them uh, interview commission members, and I just want to make sure that there's no objection if I uh, provide them with the contact info that was uh, in the um, uh, public outreach kickoff meeting uh, so that they can contact you to discuss the charter. Okay. Any other questions? And, and, the, and the idea is for them to start coming to some, some meetings as well to observe. Now, is this group in the Detroit area or are they Ann Arbor. Here? Ann They're, Arbor? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I have two questions. Uh, one, is their travel under the consultant's travel and expenses line item? There's no expense to us. No. Okay. And the second question is, um, Last time I was here, uh, it was stated that uh, U of M Flint students would be looked at to see if any of them could possibly help to work on this. Has that been done, or was it ever considered? Well, I don't remember saying that uh, I was going to reach out to anybody at U of M Flint because I don't have those contacts, but uh, I believe I did state that I had no objection if there's somebody who does have those contacts to reach out. And also, last question, Madam Chair. The proposals that were passed out, will those copies also be available to the general public? Of course. And, uh, when and how, in what manner? I mean, do we have extras tonight to give to the general public that are here? Uh, we do have some extras. We have extra copies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, to, to back up on that point, will there be a, a specific place on the website where people can get these electronically as we move forward, or have we set up a process for that yet? Okay. But if you remember, if you recall in the rules, it states that it, it must go online. Right, so mm -hmm. I probably need to set that up. Okay, new business, uh, upcoming committee and commission meetings. You have a calendar before you. So that has the, all of the finance and um, public outreach committee meetings as well as the, um, our general meetings and the committee of the whole meetings through December. Thank you. All of our meetings for the next three months will be here in this building, in this room. Yes. And as with the exception of the advisory, advisory committee. committee. Pardon? With the exception of the advisory committee. So that will be the only one that's... Uh, that is something we can discuss, though, because we did talk about it early on about having meetings uh, out in the community. So right. that's something we'll need to discuss. Plus, these, some of those are outreach meetings. So some of the outreach meetings are going to be out in the community. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, where is the advisory committee in December to meet? Has that been? Location hasn't been determined. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, okay. In relation to, I, I suppose it's under the proper place, when we adjourn and, and start up our committee, the whole meeting, be all right if we go into one of the committee rooms? We can't go into this one, but we can, we can go into this we one. We can go into this one. Right. Okay. Someone move for a chair. Here. We can't go into this one. Oh. He's taping it now, but he can't tape in either room, or is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. right, at the moment. At the moment. Paul, are, are you able to te uh, tape in either com uh, committee rooms, either? In the uh, chambers here, that's available for videotaping. One, I understand, and from our agreement, is that your committee meetings would be in the small room, and then your meetings of the whole would be out here, and that I'd be responsible for recording them here as well as broadcasting them on Channel 17 and streaming them online. Once we start going with portable equipment, the streaming becomes a lot more difficult, and everything else becomes a lot more difficult. Not only do I have to record it to a chip and then import it into the camera, manipulate it, and spend a lot more time doing it. So every time you move, including your outside locations, it's an additional burden on me. Okay. Then we'll One that I'm willing to take on. Okay, for tonight we will remain here. Thank we you. We will remain here. Okay. Um, someone move for adjournment. I move we adjourn. Okay. All right. The meeting is adjourned. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. Support. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. The meeting is adjourned. And uh, at this time, uh, Commissioner uh, Cherry will chair the uh, Committee of the Whole. A full copy of the um, MIG materials from the kickoff meeting. So that's the, the packet the public received, for the record. You're welcome. And four more copies I'm waiting for folders. They also received this. Here, take this one. I don't have notes in it. Okay. They received a copy of the charter. That was the other piece. Oh, good. Thank you. They're right down there.
knowledge. I think he has it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to connect with him and your student government group. That would be awesome. The yeah. Flint Charter Commission Committee of the Whole to order, please. So just a little primer. Uh, with first committee of the whole meeting, uh, the chair will be appointing a new chair to chair this meeting every time we have a committee of the whole meeting. Uh, and. The purpose of the meeting is to review proposals. So right now, we have uh, all the proposals, 18 proposals introduced, cover the preamble in Article 1. And so if there's anybody who would like to address any of those proposals slash sections in the first article. Chair, is what I'm looking at is that since it's a, a the same, can we accept it to hold? I'm sorry, what? Article one on here, proposal one, mm -hmm. then two, they're all exactly the same, correct, as in the book? Correct. So are we, you want to go each one, or, do, or is there going to be a change in either? Well, that's for us to decide. So. Okay. Uh, we can't actually pass these out today because there is a, uh, it has to sit here before we pass them out on to second reading. Uh, so we can't actually vote anything out of the committee of the whole today. But we do have the opportunity to discuss these. Yeah. Commissioner Cherry, I wanted to discuss proposal seven. Proposal seven. Which Ooh. is qualifications of appointed officers. Sure. This was I'm just going to, let's try to run it fluid. Uh, we don't need to be necessarily formal, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, so proposal seven, uh, this was discussed at the public outreach, or I'm sorry, the advisory committee meeting. And uh, one of the things that many people brought up also at our kickoff meeting was the need to have uh, elected and appointed officials be mm -hmm. accountable and qualified uh, in order to serve in those roles. So one of the things we actually briefly talked about during the um, advisory committee meeting was this particular section of, of the uh, Article One, and that it needed to be really evaluated perhaps and strengthened. So uh, basically what I'm saying is, is that there needs to probably be some additional work on this particular proposal. So I'm not prepared to give any written specifics at this time. So I heard a lot of those same things as well, but I mean, looking at what we have now, so it says, um, all appointed officers shall possess the background and experience appropriate for the position where certification or license is required. They need to have it and another piece. This, this is something we're gonna run into a lot. And so kind of what we're not, with one of our first conversations, how do we balance, right? So how do we balance between saying everything we could possibly want from each position and overprescribing, and then leaving the latitude and space for it to flow for, for to be appropriate 40 years later? Like how do we, we do, cause I, when I read this right here, it sounds like, oh, that'd be perfect. Like if all the people match that stuff right there, then we'll be fine, but Clearly, I mean, everybody is continuously saying this. Like, we heard this at the kickoff over and over that we need qualifications, we need people who have this thing. So, what, what do we do with this? Like, do we add more sections, a, a C and a D, and break down positions, or what, like, what else could we do with this? Um, well, so I think some of the office, do you know what all the officers are? We have what, clerk, assessor? Right, so there's like clerk, assessor, I mean, it's all the mayoral appointees is what this is referring to. So uh, director of DPW. A little louder. Sorry, director of DPW, um, city attorney. There, I mean, then some of the qualifications are more specified throughout the charter. Um, I, yeah. 
<laughs> I'm blanking on them off the top of my head, but. Um, but that brings up another chief point. Chief police, fire chief, et cetera. That brings up another point, too, of how many mayoral appointees we want to have. So as we're thinking about the qualifications, we don't have to think about the existing positions. Like, we can think about whoever we want. Do we want less mayoral appointees? Because that's been brought up. Do we want more or whatever? But we need to take that into context while we're trying to define the qualifications. Mr. Chairman, I'm also concerned about Section B. Uh, says every person serving at the pleasure of the mayor, city council, or multiple member body shall within three months after the date of appointment possess the same qualifications for office as those required for, for the mayor. And, um, I think that was put in there at the time. I think I was in office then for there are people who come in from out of town and don't have their credentials in order, they have to get them and everything, but they apply for the jobs and they give them three months. And one of those things he had to be qualified for be a resident of the city of Flint, I think, at that time. So to the attorney, uh, wasn't there a court case that said that, um, that employees of the city didn't have to be residents of the city? There, there actually is a state, state act state which... Act. State act. Yes, right. it's the, um, the Residency Act of 1999. So mm -hmm. that is correct. That is an, now an outdated and obsolete provision. Um, what the Residency Act says essentially is that an employee can be cannot be required to be located in a specific area or jurisdiction. So you can't say an employee has to be in a particular ward in the city, but it can be, you could have a requirement that a particular employee um, live uh, within 20 miles of the city or greater than that. So you, like there could be a personnel um, requirement that you live within 100 miles of the city or 50 miles of the city, if that, if that clarifies. Um, and I know that there are some city employees who are required to live within a certain um, distance of the city. I, I think police and fire, um, those are the ones that I can think off the top of my head anyways. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. Everyone is within 20 miles? I believe all of the um, appointees have uh, the job descriptions descri describe their uh, what experience and education and so forth they, they must have. Um, I know the, um, like the assessor for sure, you know, they have to have certain licensing and so forth. So I, I think all of, the, all of the appointees on the job descriptions themselves, now I guess that's a policy rather than you know being part of the charter, but that may be something we would like to take a look at, is those job descriptions. If I, if I could, I mean, and I agree with all these points, I, I would like to kind of go a step further and suggest maybe adding an additional item C around evaluation or performance reviews. If maybe that's not necessarily needed mm -hmm. in this section, but um, it would be good to once uh, there are appointed officials to have some some way to you know after a certain period of time establish how that how they're doing in those roles and have that be some kind of public open process so that the community could even comment on how they feel no. for instance the assessor is doing the police department chief what I'm asking for is an actual evaluation and performance review that's like a police review board and that's you you're gonna not. You're not gonna have happy citizens at all about police and some other fire. There's always gonna be somebody complaining about those issues, and you're never gonna get. When you have that board sitting up there, it's hard to get good people to want to come into your community and have a free hand of doing the job. If you get the right mayor or city manager to be able to say to that person who's not doing a good job, and he's out. What? But you, you want to okay. get the committee, I mean the community involved in saying, put them out. I'm saying make these evaluation and performance reviews an open meeting so that people oh, can, okay. can, can, they can make see, their voice they can see the information that's being presented about the, elect, the uh, appointed officers. You know, for instance, maybe, I don't, I don't want to pick any particular one, but say, well, you can put Somebody's, you know, 
really not performing. There may be an issue with, within. So who's telling them that they're not performing? I'm saying that there'd be some kind of performance what, review or fire, evaluation. Fire chief, who would say he's not performing? Wouldn't it be the person who appointed them? Right. I mean, but, well, I, it's up to, if yeah. we're gonna set the evaluation, it's but up she to wants us. Some, she wants more than just him. If it's, Cause that's, that would be the mayor. I, right I guess I didn't hear that. What I heard was she wants there to be an open process. So if I'm a resident and I have an issue with the fire chief, I know on June 31st, his performance review is a public meeting that I can attend. Okay, okay. Is that what I, That's yeah. what I'm trying and to And not that I'm his doing it, but you know, with all our public meetings, someone gets to have comment, if, you know, if I have it, whatever, but the process is something that is transparent. I see like, these are the required, like, so in the public, whatever happens in the evaluation, we know we get to see the process. They've met these things, this is the rationale. Move forward, we've done this, bam. I'm, well, that's what I thought I heard. So one, one potential caution on that is if you want an honest performance evaluation, <laughs> like if, if, I'm, if I'm the mayor and I'm doing a performance evaluation for the fire chief or anybody, if it's done out in public, then I have an incentive to say everything's 100% correct. You're, do, you're doing a great job. And it might not be the most, because there's, you know, if, if I'm letting my subordinate make mistakes, then, then that's my mistake, right? And so I might not, if I'm the mayor, I might not be able to give honest feedback to my appointees if that feedback process is in public. I hear what you're saying. I, I do know that if things are not done in a public, uh, an open process, then it's automatically, uh, in, in some cases, assume there's an, uh, something to hide. Or So this would be really to show some level of transparency. So whatever performance evaluation is completed, a, a public report is drafted, and then there's a comment process. Thoughts? My, my thoughts are just that, no C, no C. We, we're, a, B is good, but no C. <laughs> so I guess I wanna pose the question, how do you uh, determine that appointed officers do possess that background and experience mm -hmm. that they need? And then two years into it, if they're not doing what they need to be doing, then what? Well, Heidi, are you asking the question, who should do the evaluation of the uh, qualifications of the person? Is it the, um, the, the person who does the hiring of them? Is it um, uh, if they're appointed by the mayor or if they're appointed by council, um, it doesn't fall on them then to vet uh, and meet the standard that the person who is being proposed has the qualifications to do the job. Um. I think you, I think, I see what you're saying, Jim, but I, I really think when you're hired in by the city, you are already showed your credentials that you are able to do the job. Once you're on the job, the job is not being up to standards or done right. It's up to the city council and the mayor to decide whether this person should stay or not. And those are all public hearing meetings. So the judgment or decision can be made by them with the public's input. So it's already there to me. Hmm. So, so I see this. Oh. In, in the present charter, starting with uh, section 4301 this talks about the personnel chapter of the charter uh, development and application of policy responsibilities of the chief personnel officer uh, labor relations duties and responsibilities so it's already in this particular section 
who does the evaluating and sets that up. So unless we're talking about changing this also, uh, it's a mute point. So I think there's uh, two things there, because you seem to be talking a lot more about performance evaluation, mm -hmm. which I think is a little bit separate from qualifications and experience to be hired. And I think that maybe some, you know, when we've had public feedback and people talk about having qualified personnel um, off, or even our former Charter Commission, 74 Charter Commission members, they talk about how the first uh, mayor under the strong mayor system appointed his campaign manager. So I'm wondering if some of this is not to do with um, maybe qualifications associated with being a city administrator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, to use an example of a former uh, position that's actually not even filled at this time anymore, the parks director that was previously appointed um, by the current mayor, he didn't, he had never ran a parks department before, um, but he was given that role as our parks director, um, there were challenges with his performance, and then eventually he was let go. But it did take a lot of time, and now it seems like what happens sometimes, what, I, what I've seen happen is that you have somebody who's not performing in, in, in a function for the city government that's in this charter, mm -hmm. such as that parks director. We don't even have a parks director now. So not only do we not have the, the parks director that wasn't performing, we don't have a parks director. But, but can it, and so I guess that's what some of the things I have concerns with as we try to make amendments and, and revisions to the charter. Can the charter account for the reason we have the like staff changes and increases is usually based on budget and revenue, right? So we can set, we can say some things are mandatory, but then at a certain level, then what does that mean? That you just have to like cut the salaries and get bodies in there just to get bodies? Like, how do, we, how do we balance that? And we're going to really run into this discussion with the Ombudsman and the Civil Service Commission a lot when we, as we get to that piece. Some we need to think about, like, how do we, what do we put in the charter? Because I don't really know what we put in here to, to, like, to keep that from happening, how do you, to keep us having a parks director that knows parks. Like, how do we make that happen in the charter? Well, when you hire in, I wouldn't hire in to be the fire chief and I've been working as a railroad director or something, it does, that doesn't make any sense. So, But it, does it, it happen? It, it, it ha <laughs> well, it happens because what happened is that the administration does not follow the Sorry. charter. Okay? So somewhere along the line, we have to put in there that you're being hired and can you follow the charter? But I can well, put can some we? Teeth into that. Everybody has to have an application, whether they are appointed by the mayor or not. Is that true? Yes. So these applications should go before somebody, some committee, to say these people are qualified, and then okay. if the mayor would have a job of appointing the person that he wants out of that selected list of people who are qualified. I, I like that idea better, <laughs> but because I just was told that you, the mayor doesn't have to, uh, he can choose who he want, whether they're qualified or not. And I go, again, I go back to the job descriptions. Because each appointee, there is a job description that's more detailed than this, where it says all appointed officers shall possess the background and experience. In the job description, it's, it's detailed. And so if you want to look at something or pull something from that. Or what we can do is uh, take away some of these appointees. You know, we all know that uh, when the mayor has 10 appointees, he's trying to uh, give somebody a job that's helped him in his campaign. So maybe those 10 appointees don't need to be there. Maybe he needs one or two. The position is still there, though, and it has to be filled. So that's well, what, some what, of them. Some of them, yeah. And 
cutting them in half or whatever. No, I'm not saying want. cutting the jobs in half. I'm saying cutting the appointees by the mayor in by a lesser number. The same positions can be filled, but by applicants filling out an application and then somebody reviewing the applications to make sure that they are qualified and then selected from there. And, and to com Commissioner Metcalf's point, and we take it a step further, the real impact is how that person is removed from office. So if they aren't placed by the, an elected official and removed by an elected official, then they won't, they won't be as pressured for it. So if, I, if I'm put in place by a mayor who can remove me and this mayor is extremely one way or another, you know, to speak, if I don't fall in line with the things that he's doing, then I get removed if that's, if we don't put those protections in place, so the position still exists and the qualifications are still there, but if we allow for like a typical process, yeah. then we can avoid some of that, it, reducing the number and addressing how they're appointed and removed from office. I think I'm gonna take the example that Heidi was using as the parks director. Now if the mayor appointing somebody that have no experience in that, then that should be, we need to find a way to put, plug that hole up. Mm -hmm. That's all. Agreed. I mean, we, we're going through a lot of discussion, but basically that's all she's saying. Mm -hmm. Plug that little hole up uh, where even if the mayor appoint somebody, he, he or she has to be qualified. That's it. Yeah, so just a couple of things. In what the, for, the November 14 election, the number of mayor appointees was reduced to five. Um, and so I think what you're saying, Barry, uh, I, I look at it similarly, and I think it's just the wording in this. Right. The wording in this is so vague that you don't actually have to follow it. Um, okay. Then that's, the, that's something that we need to tighten. Yeah. That's, that's what we call a tweak. We yeah. tweak it up to fine tune it so even when he or she present that, that that person still has to be qualified. I, I just, and when she gave me that example of that, I, I just thought that was, the, the, the mayor was crazy. Mm -hmm. Mr. <laughs> Chair. I, I understand what she's saying, but in, in the end, if, if there's a person appointed who has, does not have the experience, who or what then plugs the hole? What's the confirmation the, process? The, 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 how do you confirm that they meet the qualifications? Right. He's been appointed, right. but who, how do we who, confirm? Who, who makes sure or ensures sure. that when that happens, that is it a, a special uh, outside no. commission? Or no, the, the, I would say that count, I mean, uh, commit, uh, <laughs> city council. All he's doing is, yeah, all he's doing is appointing and the city council is saying, okay, is that person qualified? That's it. So the charter already allows for that. Could you point no, out that? No, because he just I, said. I, I think within, within the charter, I can't, I haven't got a charter right in front of me, but um, my memory serves me right. It says there's a spot in it that says where they're uh, with council approval. Uh, section four, four, section right. four, two hundred three, item C. The head of each department shall be appointed by the mayor in accordance with law and with the approval of the city council, mm -hmm. and shall so serve at the pleasure of the mayor. Right. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't plug up the hole. The, that person is not qualified. That's well, what she's trying to make sure. Well, the council does its job. Confirming, well, yeah, you confirm. If, if you got to. If politics impacts the mayor, politics is going to impact the council too. So that I think that needs to be plugged up and tweeted where that person, what? even the council can say, bring me the paperwork to show that individual is qualified so for if, the position. If council, if council uh, approves and the mayor appoints and the council approves a person unqualified for the position, they're violating the charter. Right, you know? right. So what do we do? Uh, we get we we boil the oil or what? You know. <laughs> well, there's a lot of things, Jim, right now that the council is not doing, well, or is are not following by the hasn't charter. Done. And has, hasn't done. And hasn't done. So we're trying to plug up the holes with I think.
Fifth Amendment. But the charters can, still can say, you know, you got to have these. Yeah. Seems to me that what we're looking for is some sort of way that there's a consequence if uh, the charter isn't followed. But didn't the question come up when MML was here? I don't remember the answer. I know we asked them, and I know what was I that? asked. <laughs> But I don't remember getting <laughs> the solid Michigan answer. Municipal League, when we had the training? Yes. Yeah, we, we I have not heard back. No, but we asked while they were in here. We said, you know, so how do you make, you know, how do we make the enforceable. charter enforceable? Enforce. And um, there was no real answer. It was like you can, you can take them to court, possibly, depending on certain things. And yeah. So maybe we need to invent a mechanism. <laughs> yeah. Invent a punitive portion. I think we need to move on. I, we can beat it to death now. It's not over. It's not over. Yeah, I just think it needs to be re re reworded with some of the ideas that were given this evening and by what the advisory committee um, came up with and then represented. Mm -hmm. Are there any other proposals that people want to talk about? I'm looking at the Declaration of Rights, number two, and uh, under the preamble, yeah, proposal 18. No, under the preamble, yeah, 18. Yeah. If City it, officials shall pledge themselves to assure residents clean and safe neighborhoods, safe and decent housing, job opportunities, clean air. Uh, our city officials aren't doing a thing. Just those two statements, they are completely letting down the citizens of Flint. Well, the print in red, is that the added changes? Yes, it is. Yeah, it, those aren't currently in there. Well, I'm looking at job opportunities. I've had that underlined for quite a while, and when I was running for this office, I talked about tax money going for city jobs, people who live in the city, uh, 20 miles from Flint, is not even close to living in the city. That's a, a cop out for somebody to go to Grand Blank or some nice neighborhood. Well, do we run the risk of not getting a qualified person? I mean, because some of the, the jobs will go unfilled if we're seeking, if they do not wish to live in the city. Of course. Well, I guess I. It's, it's state. It's a state law, though. You can't. Yeah, it's a state law. Then it's a state law. Change. Right. Right. But, you know, I, I'm thinking about other jobs that don't have big qualifications. Uh, people in Flint who say they're looking for a job but can't find a job, and our low-entry jobs are being uh, taken by people in other cities. I think our whole job, our whole uh, hiring practice in Flint is is not very good. And I, I as a, a senior in high school, I started working for DPW, and I saw the nepotism, and I saw where folks came from, from, and the number of people in one family, father, uncle, grandfathers, mothers, daughters, and so on, all working for the city of Flint. But I don't think we can supersede law, and and that's almost what we have. What we'd have to do, law allows it. Well, we've got to supersede something if we're going to make Flint a decent place to live, and if we're going to have a, a charter that that means something to the city of Flint. So we have a charter, and. Uh, the citizens of Flint still aren't being looked at seriously because job opportunities and appointments are done out of uh, friendship and other things. Well, you're kind of talking about two things here, Chuck. One, you were talking about distance, and now you're talking about um, hiring procedure, right? It, because once well, you say, when all we're talking in, about distance, we, we can throw that out the window because the state law says, hey, 20 miles, so we have to change mm -hmm. the state law. So we, it's no sense of arguing that point. 
the next one you saying well you is said though so we have to change the state law right you have and to we change need the to start system. we need to start a process for changing the law in some of these things we're just going to keep going on and going on um but i i agree with you but i knew at the time when i first hired on it, that fight was going on way back then in the 70s. Uh, and there was new people coming in, wanting out of town, wanting to be on the police department. And at that time, that law wasn't in effect. Right. And then they were arguing bit about that. And then pretty soon, allegedly a group of people got involved of stretching that. And they got it approved. So. That's what you're going to have to do. An outside group of people are going to have to come out and say, hey, this is what we want. We want to be able to hire people within our community that think and like our community. But until that happens, we can do all what we want to do and send it, and the governor has to look at this, and they're going to kick that back automatically because we're saying something about the state law. And Question for the... Uh attorney, uh, is it possible to put something in an application saying preference to city residents? That's something I'll have to look up for you, but I'm, I'm quite certain that you can't require that. I mean, I, I would be happy to look into it, research it, and issue a written opinion, but I'm quite certain that's something that you, you cannot do. What? I, I would love to be able to do it because then you can hire people that's in the city. And what happened, I think, their argument was we don't have qualified people in the mm -hmm. community. That was their argument at the time. Well, I could see going outside the community for certain positions. Um, a city manager, uh, fire chief, police chief, people like this. I can see certain positions where we would want to uh, go outside, maybe hire somebody from across the country. But there are a lot of positions in Flint that, to me, are just given away. And there ought to be people in Flint for uh, certain entry-level jobs that those jobs can stay in Flint. And we talk about our tax base. Well. If our tax money is going out of Flint and the people with those jobs are going out of Flint, we're never going to have a tax base. I know I'm rambling, but this has been a, a, a thorn in my behind for a long time. So I have a question, not to be naive, but what's the purpose of the Declaration of Rights? Say it again, please. What is the purpose of the Declaration of Rights in the Charter? Why, why is it in there? What's it for? Well, it's interesting. Um, there are some um, municipalities that have a declaration of rights and there are some that, are, that don't. When you, when you look at the um, National Civic League um, Model City Charter piece, there's a kind of a discussion uh, about um, inclusion of a declaration of rights um, and some feel as, um, as it's a way to be able to, for the, for the, uh, the city, uh, and the, uh, to be able to establish some high level expectations of what, how uh, we're expecting government to behave and what we're expecting it to be able to do. That there are some, that there are, are, are high level, um, goals, if you will, uh, to work towards achieving. Um, they're directed towards um, ways in which to direct the city to how it will deal with and interact with the citizens of the city. So it's kind of a, a, a high level plane piece. Now, the Detroit, for example, has a declaration as part of their charter. But, uh, for example, Saginaw does not, nor does Ann Arbor. Um, 
and um, so it's up to the up to the individual city uh, to to have a uh, if they want to have a declaration of rights. Similar to I the think Bill that of there's some I think there's some advantages to having a declaration of rights because it sets a, an expectation we have of all those who are elected to office and who work for the city about how they're going to interact with and how they're going to treat uh, the citizens uh, of the city and uh, how we view uh, everybody. So it's really kind of like, um, it's also a, a description of what the work that we expect uh, a city to do. Um, and that's why um, I brought it forward because I think that um, the, that the original Declaration of Rights was uh, really pretty good because it, um, it does set out some uh, high level um, expectations, uh, particularly in the area of, of human rights and, and how we treat, treat each other. And I thought that there were some areas that could just use some, some um, um, tweaking in, in various terms um, to add a little more strength to them. Um, and, and I added those in, in those areas that I thought that, that, that were important um, from my perspective. Specifically clean and safe neighborhoods, safe and decent housing, access to safe drinking water uh, are all, I think, important pieces. Uh, safe roadways, walkways, um, all of those are things we expect the city to be able to do. In addition, I thought that there needed to be a, a, some strength given to um, equal protection for all people within the city and added into it, uh, no person shall be denied the enjoyment of civil or political rights or be discriminated against in the exercise thereof because of race, color, creed, national origin, age, disability, sex, sex orientation, gender expression, or gender identity. I took that right from the Detroit um, Declaration as well, and I found it interesting that it wasn't in, uh, in our charter uh, to begin with. So I've added that in. I, uh, I'm really glad you put an anti-discrimination policy in there. What about adding religion? I think it's there, isn't it? Is it? Where would that be? Did I miss it? I must have missed it. Okay. Let's put religion in there too. Yeah, indeed. Sorry. Great. Uh, additionally, to Commissioner Metcalf's question, I mean, obviously there's the state law that we we can't change in our charter about the 10 or 20 miles rule from the 1999 uh, act. But I do know it costs a lot of money to live in the city of Flint. Um, I pay more insurance than my parents who don't live in the city of Flint. Uh, I know folks who have, I mean, basically the cost of living in some cases is higher in the city of Flint and that's a disincentive to live here or it could be. Could we create something that provides an incentive, like a, um, consider it like a cost of living uh, increase, so that if you move into the city of Flint, you basically are, you can't make anybody move to the city of Flint, right? Because that's the state law, but could we provide an incentive to get you to come to the city of Flint? If you are an appointed great ordinance kind of a thing, but not so much of a charter issue. Well, I'm just yeah. trying to think through these things. Okay. I have, I have a question, question on uh, Article One Six Hundred One, the oath of office. It says that once you hired in or appointed or whatever, you're going to follow. The charter. Simple. <laughs> That's it. Right then and there, right there. So we how do we stop if the mayor or the police person or whoever is not following a charter, 
What do we do? Forfeit. Commissioner Cherry, uh, in, in relation to Barry's point, under proposal 12, item B, number two, states that four. violations of any provisions of this charter are punishable by forfeiture. So the city council can remove any um, elected or appointed official. Uh, and then if they don't, the citizens basically can um, approach the city council to force them to hold a hearing. So for an example, you're uh, Parks. Direct, no, direct, what was he? Uh, Recreational director? Parks and Rec, yeah. Parks and Rec person. He could have been bounced out by the council or citizen group. Is that right? It's, it's by the charter. By the charter. By the charter. Wait, where's the citizen Commission, Commissioner McKenzie, you, you wanted to make a point, and I'm sorry I didn't see you. Where did that, is that in here? Thank you. Proposal 18, and kind of got. Um, I wanted to know why the first part of the original preamble was take, scratched off. It says, we the people of the city of Flint, in order to guarantee equality, freedom, justice, and effective government to each of our city's residents, do hereby adopt this charter. Um, I'd like to know why that was taken off. It was written by uh, Donna Tennant from Whittier Junior High School. So that's, that's a high school student. So I'd just like to know why that was taken off. I took it off because as I read uh, in um, the uh, National Civic, Civic League's model charter about what are the um, elements that, that the city needs to claim in order to be able to have the broadest ability to govern uh, under the state laws. That, uh, the pre that that preamble needed to have a statement in it that enabled the city to be able to um, have, uh, be able to use all of the, um, all of the powers that are provided for uh, under state law and under um, uh, the um, Home Rule Act. Um, and um, that we needed that then, and following then the National City's uh, thoughts there to um, have in it all of the elements that would enable us to be able to do that. So it's not so much an objection to what the, what the, the uh, person who wrote that originally. The intent um, uh, on my part was to make sure that when we uh, declare what we are doing, uh, that we're reaching out and getting all of the authority, the city has all of the authority uh, that it can possibly uh, obtain uh, to be able to function. So we, the people of the city of Flint, under the Constitution and, and laws of the state of Michigan, in order to secure the benefits of local self-government and to provide for an honest and accountable government, do hereby adopt this charter and confer upon the city the following powers, such as uh, su subject to the following restrictions and prescribed by the following procedures and governmental structures. Uh, et cetera. And that's why um, I put that in there. Uh, when you look at the, pre at the preamble of other, uh, at other cities, it's quite similar to this particular one that I added in here. I thought it needed to be updated and brought into uh, compliance uh, so that we could um, have all the benefits uh, provided by Home Rule. I think that after the wording and regional cooperation, uh, a semicolon could be added 
and then reinsert it in order so that it reads uh, professional management, strong political leadership, citizen participation, and regional cooperation in order to guarantee equality, freedom, justice, and effective government to each of our city's residents do hereby adopt this charter. I feel that's important for the citizens to know that we are looking at their rights as a person and as citizens of Flint. So I'm requesting that that be placed back in. Where did you say inserted? After the last uh, word cooperation. Put a semicolon oh, at the, at the and end. then just put in order to guarantee and the rest of the other sentence. I think that's important for the citizens to know that we are looking at their particular individual rights. Also, I was wondering if we can add the word on uh, the third sentence for an honest, transparent, and accountable government. Can we add the word transparent after honest, <coughs> the third sentence? Pardon me. Mm -hmm. I agree with Commissioner McKenzie that these are really important things that we should stand behind her. That we should add these in. And then I'm also looking at, I know that I, number three, uh, the fourth sentence or the second sentence, full sentence in red, where you have sex and sex, sexual orientation. Should the first word sex be deleted? It seems like it's redundant, even though it came out of the Detroit Charter. Should it be age, disability, sexual orientation? And delete the first word, sex? I, I believe the word sex means di differentiating Female. between man and woman. Right. Gender. Isn't that sexual orientation? No, no, no. 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 Gender, okay. man and woman, not uh, homosexual or lesbian. Okay, now what about gender expression and gender identity? Gender identity, is that the same as sex? No, no. no. It's that's not. the new one. Yeah, so, no. so sex, um, don't, I don't want to get quoted wrong in this, but I believe sex is biological and gender identity is personal uh, expression. <coughs> Thank you. Pardon. Jim, do you kind of accept those uh, added or? I don't think I have to. No, I, I, I'm just asking. I'm asking what your, your opinion. <laughs> you wrote it, and she's putting something in it. What do you think? I'm thinking about it. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Another thing we could consider in thinking about the public comment we received earlier is opening the opportunity for one of our current students in the Flint school system to take an approach at possibly drafting something. because. This was a, a junior high student 40 years ago who crafted that, and if we want, maybe as an out opportunity to outreach, and it, it may not replace that, but that could be an opportunity. Brian, as much as I think that's, a, uh, that's an interesting idea, I'm a little bit concerned about the implications from, uh, from the ability of the city to uh, obtain all of its rights uh, through the, from the state that it possibly can, can gather in. And um, I think there's some, uh, I think there needs to be some care taken with that to make sure that we've, uh, we have the appropriate statement that, uh, to be able to achieve that. Well, I, I it's think just that, my concern. Yeah, I think you achieved that by what you wrote uh, because you did state under the Constitution and laws of the state of Michigan. That's very clear. I have no problem with that. It's just adding those other uh, wording for the citizens is what um, I'm uh, asking that it be put back in. Well, you can put it in. You don't have to ask for it. You can put it in. You can just put it in. Uh, Commissioner Chair, when, as we work through a uh, committee of the whole and we have proposals, uh, are changes to proposals 
Uh, uh, well, how does that process go? Do you have we, to introduce? We can make amendments to the proposals. We amend the proposals, yes. and then the or amendments have to be. New so we can do either or. Yes. Okay, that was we can't my. Introduce new proposals today, but. Right. That that was my question. So if I wanted to make a significant change to the. Um, this existing article, you can either propose an amendment that we vote on as a body and up or down, or I can just bring in my whole new proposal that's totally different. Okay. You know, our rules say that, that once a proposal is, is presented, it becomes the property of the, of the entire body, mm -hmm. and the True. body can do anything it wants with it. True. Right. Yeah. You know, so if some part of the body wants to ch make a change to it, um, they can make a Make make a particular change to it, and uh, then we have to vote on that. Not till well, the third reading. Well. Eventually, but not it looked like third it, reading. Not till the third reading do we wow. vote. No, no, no. I don't no. think that's true. We got three. We vote. So what? Ha so, if I understand this correctly, right now everything is in our uh, general orders. I believe right. all our proposals right now are in general orders, Correct. and. So if I said, which I, I may do in a minute, is like bring up a proposal that we all agree on and say proposal one, I move that we send this to second reading, someone supports, then we vote on it. If we get enough in favor, that specific one goes to second reading. And so mm -hmm. then now people, so we vote at that point. Okay. So for instance, in this one right here, proposal 18, we could say, I, um, Commissioner McKenzie could say, I, I propose that we amend it, adding this language. We vote on that, it goes up or down. And then we can say, I propose that we move this to second reading, the way it's you know, now stated. If, we d if not enough people are in agreement, we vote it down. It just stays in general order, though. That doesn't mean it disappears. It stays in general order. So it won't move forward until we vote on it to, to get to the next step. Right. And we have two, three. Okay. And we're not going to be voting to report anything tonight because we have a waiting period That's from introduction. Right. Oh, OK. I forgot about that. And so does that mean that we'll be able to get copies of these in, in a Word format so that we could make these m changes and then propose a new we one? We do have instance? copies in Word format. Yeah, we do. They send it uh, through email. Oh, good. Yeah. Great. came out this morning. Thank you. I haven't been on my yeah. charter email yeah. today. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Cherry, I wanted to discuss Proposal 13, the conflict of interest statement. Can we go back to 12? Go back to, oh, can I'm we sorry. go back to 12? <laughs> yeah. um, let's see. Did we start on one of those already? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. She started on B2. Thank All you. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, so on, on uh, B2, this was to try and explain uh, this would be how we would potentially enforce if a elected or appointed official was not meeting their um, qualifications. But here's the, here's the kicker. It just says under B1 that they lack at any time the qualifications required by law or this charter. So it's like a vague statement, right? And it's something that is open to interpretation. Uh, and it seems to be it's that same level of open to, to interpretation that keeps this from being actually used or um, somebody could challenge it and say, well, I feel I do have the qualifications required in this charter because it just says vague statement over here <laughs> to vague statement over here. So it just seems like there's, this might be that point where we were trying to figure out how to hold that level of accountability, um, but it's just not strong enough language. We need something more. So what do you propose? And we think about it. Come up with some stronger <laughs> language. <laughs> well, I think on the earlier vague statement, we could require some professional qualifications with certain positions. You could, ha you could need to be a member of the, I forget what the organization is, but for city managers in order to be appointed as city administrator or while I think all of our city attorneys have been members of the state bar, we could associate, you know, require that the city attorney be a member of the state bar, et cetera. But is that kind of in there already? Because, let me pull it back up. In the, the first one we opened, was it proposal two? No, not proposal two. Oh, 
2007. So question yeah, about where, that. It, where it says in such instances where official certification or license is required of an appointed officer of the city, the officer shall be required to demonstrate possession of said certif cer certificate or license. Wouldn't that address that? So when, I guess when I hear that, Reed, you can't be an attorney without passing the bar. Is that what that's saying? I don't know. I mean. <laughs> okay. You have to. And then I have a question about number one. Lacks at any time any qualifications required by law. If you have to present your credentials, your certifications and licenses upon um, being hired, how do you lose those qualifications? They may, you may have to do something for like annual renewal or certain continuing education things. So for instance, um, for, for planning, there's a thing called AICP. It's a certification you have to take X amount of courses over 18 months or it expires. And so if you don't do that, then okay. you what else? Yeah. I think the Mr. Chair, has um, I'm, the thought that's going through my mind has to do with who should set the requirements for these positions. Um, should that be done by uh, the legislative body um, of the organization uh, of the city? Um, should that be done by the, um, who, should, who should do that? I'm not sure it ought to be set in charter because we're looking for a document that'll uh, last for a long time and qualifications for particular positions uh, they change uh, over time, so I think I'd want to. I think I'd want to see the um, establishing what those qualifications are uh, to be done um, legislatively or um, by the administration, um, one or the other. Um, but that, uh, but that, that folks got to have those qualifications. I don't know quite how to get there, but there ought to be qualifications for the position. I don't know, I'm, I'm getting balled up in this. No. <laughs> other thoughts on this topic? Any other proposals that people want to talk about at this time? I would like to discuss proposal 13. Conflict of interest. So I think this is, it's good to have a conflict of interest statement and, and that is definitely here. Um, I think it could be strengthened and maybe include an ethics statement or a stronger ethics statement mm -hmm. on top of the conflict of interest statement. I think we could, we might want to consider defining conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. Isn't there a uh, definition regarding conflict of interest? Yeah, I agree. I think that, that there needs to be some meeting. sort of statement meeting. of ethics. Six One, six this does not look pretty weak. Other. <laughs> 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 If I may, when you really understand that charter, and I'm enjoying listening to you guys, but when they enacted that charter in the areas you're talking about, whether it was a mistake or not, they told the council after the enactment of the charter in 74, put the meat on it by enacting ordinances to go with that to further define it. The council over the years has not put certain ordinances in place. It is some ordinances in place that further defines the conflict of interest. So when you really read the stuff you're talking about, I'm enjoying the conversation, but 
you're right, people didn't put further ordinances in place to put the teeth, and when you violate them ordinances, you violate the charter because they hook on to that charter. Mr. Mays, is there, is there an ethics statement um, by, uh, or council is adopted by ordinance? Not like it should be, but the people and the authors told them to do some of that and some of that is missing and it should be updated and strengthened. Now you got to decide, um, that's why I'm enjoying what you're saying, if certain people didn't do further what they told them to do. So the ordinances that you're talking about, um, Councilman Hayes, for the conflict of interest or any ordinance, are those the amendments that were added after the 74 charter was adopted? Whether they are or not, some of them are, but it ain't like it should be because when they say lack the qualifications, meaning if I moved out of my district, I would lack the qualifications. If the mayor moved out of his district, then the enforcement arm is to forfeit him, forfeit him from office. So you can even go further by ordinance to do some of what y'all are talking about, but I don't want to interfere with what you want to do as far as strengthening that. But they told them to enact ordinances to further strengthen that after we adopted the charter. That's why I keep referring to the council and what they should do or shouldn't have done over the years as enforcement and strengthen. So, One thing to consider too though is, and in, in you're exactly right, I think the weakness perhaps in not, defi in not defining enough in the charter itself is the city council and the mayor can change ordinances, right? So if the political situation arises in which the conflict of interest or whatever issue it is that is on here doesn't agree with what's, you know, the, the, char the ordinance itself does not agree with what they want to do, they can always change the ordinance. Chairperson, <laughs> Chairperson Cherry, I'm wondering if we should uh, have a copy of the amendments or if we already have them. Uh, we've got, I think we have them in our original notebook. If we shouldn't take those and look at those amendments pertaining to what we're looking at um, to change. Do you, do you have, Heidi, do you have extra copies of the public outreach ones? Because they were included in the back of our public outreach I never packet. So. I was supposed to receive a packet and I've never received it. I have the copies of the materials that were printed out and needed to get with Cleo and I hadn't had a chance to before the meeting I to get the extra copies I have a copy. of the booklets and basically produce that for you. So I'll do that to you. I, have, I think I have a copy. So this document that you're talking about is what we need to be looking at? as far as amendments? Yeah. Those, okay. those are all the amendments. Yeah. All the amendments that have been made. And also the uh, version that, um, the version of the charter that is listed with the city code online also has all the amendments in it. Not the PDF version, but the one that's got the code attached to it. So again, because I don't see anything in here about conflict of interest, is should we be looking at these other amendments uh, since Councilman Mays brought it up to see what was amended pertaining to what we're looking at here, to any changes that we may be making in these proposals? Well, th these are all the amendments that have been made to the charter. I, I think she's referring to the ordinances. The ordinances and amendments. The oh, ordinances and the A copy of, uh, that's, I don't, did the city print the full ordinance?
to the code? Yeah. Right, but and the, the and most code of those is online. Are millages. Most of them, yes. Yeah. Can, can you clarify what it is that you're looking for in particular okay. from the code? The section that defines conflicts of interest? Yes, okay. because if, if there's something out there that's, that we can use that's already been passed to help give us that strength, that teeth that we're talking about, mm -hmm. then sure. I'd like to look at it, and I think we all need to look at it. First, I'll say, um, I will, in this particular instance, I'll search for that and mm -hmm. see if I can find that in particular. Um, one of the nice features about the Code of Ordinances as it is on the website, you can search by keyword. And so it may be that you can type in conflict or conflict of interest, and it will um, very quickly find every time that word or set of words, the phrase of word, is mentioned in the code of ordinances. And so it, it's all, if, if you're in the process of, and this is for everybody, if you're in the process of submitting proposals or any kind of language and you're looking for a little bit of extra clarification, um, that might be a, a helpful way to kind of shorten the time that you're, so you're not just searching through the, uh, the, the entire code um, almost at random. Commissioner Cherry? Yeah. Under proposal number 11, ordinances required in the public interest, in regards to the statement I made about an ethics statement, uh, it does say that the city shall adopt by ordinance such standards for the conduct of public affairs as deemed necessary and proper. So this is under um, item C. Uh, so, you know, it does make me want to go and see what's out there under this ordinance. The last part, I have a question um, about item e, to number 10E in that same proposal. The Standards of Conduct Board shall review at least annually any reports, registration statements, declarations, or any other documents required to be filed under ordinances adopted by the city under this section. My question is, How's that going? Is there a, a review that is continuing to happen on an annual basis? Is that it's not, it's not. there's no there's no standards of conduct it's board? No. Okay. No standards of conduct board. Exists. You saying it just doesn't exist? I believe that uh, city clerk kind of around ordinance. You could ask her about. But I don't think it's currently being done. It hasn't met for years. You said. Tom, what part of the charter? The I can't recall. Uh, does it? Does the charter create the standards of conduct board? And when you answer, if you could do it at the microphone so we can pick it up. 13. I saw it earlier. Standards kind of report here. But I, uh, so let's see. While Tom's looking for that, we certainly need to do something about this um, proposal. Which one? Just in a general sense. Which one? Proposal, proposal 11. 11. Inadequate. 11. Seems to me what we have to do something about it. Is Getting people to follow this thing yeah. and yeah. the consequences yeah. of not. True. Yeah. So we have to. 100%. Uh, Article 1, Section 602. 602, yeah. specifically asking about 
item E. It does call for it. the creation of one. Yeah. It's in here, so we got everybody in there that should be in there, but it doesn't exist. Yeah, 31641. A seven person standard of conduct board uh, is created consisting of the chief legal officer, city clerk, the ombudsman, and four residents unanimously selected, uh, unanimously nominated by the official members and appointed by the mayor. So the council doesn't have any role in uh, selecting those at all. But the council has a role in uh, selecting the uh, city clerk and the ombudsman. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, the, uh, the standards contact board met prior, to, uh, met when the present city clerk was appointed. When, at the time she was appointed and, and for several years thereafter. And then it just went out of existence because it never met. I, I don't know what the answer to that is. So. Do you know about what year that was? I'm not sure, but I just, that would be about the year 2000, approximately. I, I just questioned it and I, found out that I couldn't get the answer about that time. So. <laughs> Mr. Chair, it's been two hours, and uh, Mr. Conroy uh, did state that when they were going through this process, they never <laughs> met for longer than two hours. <laughs> I request an adjournment. <laughs> Support. So, is there support? Support. Yeah. A motion for adjournment has been made, and there is a second for that. If there is no, is there any objection? No, I'm not objecting. I, I, I I'd like to ask a question. Uh, because part of today's uh, time frame, we had our general meeting. And the next meeting on the 22nd is also a general commission meeting. Would you prefer that that be a committee of the whole? Uh, I would. I don't know if other people. Okay. So I would prefer that. All right. So on uh, October 22nd, strike general commission and committee of, add committee of the whole. So does that mean you want it in the committee room? We'll have to check with Inez and yes, make sure yes. that's if, all okay. If it's available. I think this is okay. I mean, we're here. <laughs> it's warm. We have heat. Our, I bet you <laughs> so um, prior to adjournment, just a couple of housekeeping uh, items. Number of question on ordinances and what have you. Uh, I know I have emailed uh, Attorney Roth a couple of times to ask questions about some of this stuff. Uh, and did you, is there a process you want us to follow? I, all, all I was going to say is that I'm happy to address questions as they come up. Feel free to email them uh, to me. Um, that's generally the best way to, to get a hold of me. But um, I can also be reached um, by the, uh, at, at the legal department by phone. Um, and if anybody needs my number after the meeting, I'll be happy to provide it to you. And in I'd also like to um, have the authority uh, at the end of the meeting on the 22nd, if there's some business that must be handled by the commission, if we could take a moment to call uh, the meeting to order in case there's uh, something comes up in the meantime. So I think we just have to post it, right? It was up also. We should probably, we should um, probably at the beginning, don't you think? Hmm? We should go at the beginning. Yeah. Either at the beginning. Mr. Chair? Uh, yeah. Could we, um, this is a motion 
uh, that the meeting on the 22nd, the first 15 minutes, be allocated to the general commission and to take care of any unfinished or new business, and then the meeting proceeding that would be the committee of the whole. Support. So we have, I'm gonna need help on this. Do I need to? <laughs> Do we need to, because um, we, we have the motion to adjourn on the table, right? Mm -hmm. Table it. We're in discussion. Oh. <laughs> okay, so we're going to table the motion uh, to, to adjourn for a moment. Mm -hmm. All right. And you have a motion to have a 15, to set aside 15 minutes prior to the other meeting to do the general commission meeting? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's make it a light agenda then? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Is, are there any, is there a second to that? Mm -hmm. All favorite. right, any objection? Seeing no, yeah. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, unanimous. All right, uh, on the motion to adjourn, uh, all those in favor, raise your hand. Okay, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Come out here. Right. Yeah. Right. I think in general, we should post it as.